Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for today's webinar, webinar brought to you by Expo North and Orkney Islands Council. Uh, today we are joined by Tim Wright of the Crowd Economy Specialist Twin Tangibles, who is going to guide us through the art of working within the crowd economy and how to maximise relationships with your audience. Um, before we begin, just to let you know that today's session is being recorded uh, and, as I mentioned, broadcast on Expo North's Facebook page. The recording of this session will be available to watch on Expo North's Facebook page uh, shortly after we have finished. Um, we'll have time at the end, the last 10 minutes or so um, after Tim's presentations for uh, the Q&A. So please post any questions that you may have into the Q&A box, uh, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, so that just leaves me to say thank you once again for joining us. Uh, enjoy our webinar. And Tim, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much indeed, Ollie, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, great to be here. Uh, if you have uh, tuned in to what the Chancellor of the Exchequer this afternoon, I think you probably made the, the, the best joy. Uh, so uh, my name's Tim Wright. I work for a company called Tangibles, and I also spend time working with Expo North. Twin Tangibles is a management consultancy that specializes in the crowd economy. And the time that I work with Expo North, I function as a digital and crowd economy specialist. And uh, that is in support of their program of support activities that operate throughout the year. And I also get involved with their uh, annual conference and uh, in the creation of content throughout the of the year. I'm trying to make my slides work, which is... Ah, there we go. Marvellous. So one of the reasons I'm speaking to you about the crowd economy is I've published quite widely on the topic. And if any of you uh, suffer from insomnia, I would suggest that uh, one of these will help get you through the night, either awake or asleep. So do feel free to, to dig in. Um, what I plan to cover today, um, I put into a kind of brief agenda so that we can bring some st structure to what we're talking about. What I want to address is why are we talking about the crowd economy now? Why is it a significant topic to bring up at the moment? Clearly, I want to define in a little bit more uh, depth and precision what the crowd economy is, <clears throat> what makes it distinctive, what are its key characteristics, and what makes it different from some of the other um, engagement opportunities that you have. I want to look about some of the specific opportunities that emerge within the crowd economy, what they look like, how the dynamics of them change, and look at those in a kind of generic sense and a high level, then look at some specific examples. And some of those examples will be very well known to you. Um, and some of them I hope uh, will perhaps be new. Um, and a number of them will be specifically from the cultural and heritage sectors. And so addressing a, a specific aspect of that. Then I want to look a little bit at the tools that are available for you, readily available for you to actually build the crowd asset that you might want to use in the course of engaging with the crowd economy. And then offer you some generic advice at the end of that um, with a view to um, making it um, possible for you to readily get to grips with the opportunity the crowd economy um, presents. And then, uh, as Ollie said, I'd like to leave a kind of Q&A session at the end so that I can take questions from you about what we've talked about today, either things that have occurred to you um, in the lead up to this or anything that arises through the course of this presentation. And there is a Q&A and chat box function within Zoom that you're using. Um, and if you want to raise those questions at the very end of it. So um, what I want to do then is um, jump into the, the first piece of that. Why now? Why are we talking about the crowd economy now? Why is it important to think about? I think there's a number of factors that have brought this the kind of um, front and center of things that we need to consider. Clearly, the COVID-19 disruption has um, caused a major discontinuity in the way that we typically undertake uh, our business and commercial activities. 
but it's also reminded us how important digital infrastructure is. Um, those organizations that had positioned themselves effectively uh, with a strong digital infrastructure um, have been able to ride the disruption of the COVID-19 situation um, more readily than others. Some of them have been able to continue to operate relatively well for those that have seen a decline in uh, footfall and face-to-face -face activity. Some of them have been able to carry on um, activities digitally. And in fact, when we see that the Zoom, the tool that we're using today has seen a 300-odd uh, percent increase in its profits over the past year because of the number of people that turn to digital technology to allow them to continue to meet, to carry out transactions and, and try and um, maintain their, their normal activities through a digital means. For a lot of organizations, that means um, to a certain extent catching up. So they have brought about a position where they are using digital tools in a way that have been available for a long time, but have never actually thought about um, or spent the time and effort to invest in putting them in place in a, in a business or commercial context. What I'd like us to think about now is not just catch up to where we could and should be, but also to cast ahead and think about what is emerging in the future and what may be a more enduring outcome from COVID. One of those is the change in digital consumption. So more and more people have been ready to consume and transact through a digital medium, and that presents opportunities for us. So we're both making sure that we take advantage of the implementation of digital tools to actually give ourselves resilience, but to look forward and take advantage of digital engagement through a crowd economy model um, so that we are exploiting the opportunities of digital tools. We also know certainly in the kind of heritage and, and um, cultural sectors that we're anticipating changes in behavior of consumption in, in what we produce. So we're looking at um, uh, did evolving uh, visitor demand. We are seeing greater emphasis on sustainable tourism growth. So this is um, uh, underpinned by the green agenda and, and low carbon usage. So people's willingness to access these facilities remotely and do them in a more uh, ecologically. And we know that enabling technologies that allow us to do that are both becoming more sophisticated, more readily available, and as we've seen in the last year, um, people are more ready to consume these things. So these types of megatrends, as they are described, uh, are likely to affect these two sectors, the cultural and the heritage sectors, quite profoundly in the coming years. And we need to prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready for that and move into new model delivery. And I also think that in the context of a crowd economy, strangely enough, cultural and heritage organizations, uh, I think, are quite well placed to engage with the crowd. There are certain characteristics in the crowd economy that we will cover in the, in the course of this presentation. I think will be more familiar to cultural and heritage organizations than perhaps some of the other groups. That's to say you have a sense of passion-driven engagement, you have a sense of being of people engaging with you and assisting you through motivations that are other than monetary, and this sense of tribal and um, emotional bonds to particular thematics, which as you'll see are, are aspects of the crowd economy. These are things that I think cultural and heritage organizations can quite typically find in the work that they today. So I think this may well be an opportunity for them. So let's begin then um, with a little definition. What do I mean when I talk about the crowd economy? There is a lot of different aspects to the crowd economy, but the fundamental thing is that the source of value creation is external to the organization. And we think about that for a second. Typically, we think of creating value from an organization by from internal activities. We come up with a product, we protect it, and we take it to market, and we transact with customers who procure that. So it's a very much an in, within the organization. It's constrained within the organization in the way that we create value. In a crowd economy model, we are actively looking external to the organization for um, opportunities for 
um, creating value. And that begins to blur the edge of where the organization begins and ends. But it's also important for us to think about um, what that means in terms of some of our skills, our competences and behaviors um, that, so that we can adapt them from a traditional model of an internally gen generated value to one that is appropriate for externally created value. And we'll look at some specific examples that and illustrate that rather theoretical statement there with some, um, some real examples. It's all in large part stemmed from the ability that we have with the advent and ubiquity of digital communication technologies shorten the distance between us and the people that we transact with. Very key that we understand that this idea of shortening that distance between us um, and disintermediating, to use the, the technical uh, term, disintermediation process is key to this, that we can build more authentic and genuine relationships between us and those that we transact with because our ability to directly connect with them uh, is facilitated through the advent of digital technologies. And consequently then, as you would expect, you know, digital technologies and the, and the facilities that they give us are very fundamental and central to the crowd economy and why the crowd economy has become um, a more common thing in uh, recent times. So we think about how that manifests itself in a, in a slightly academic way. We can think of um, models of organizations, of value generation, how we create value. So if I drew on something like Porter's value chain, a very traditional and um, widely understood and widely used model for understanding the points at which value creation um, exists within a, an organization. It's a very linear setup, but we can think even now of how that can be changed by integration with um, more collaborative models to give us uh, a slightly um, a more sophisticated of how even with the advent of social technologies, these types of, of compartmentalized activities that exist within an organization can be engaged with by uh, bringing external parties into um, working with us to um, transact within those, those uh, um, within an organization. So from a finance point of view, we can think about crowdfunding, we can think about um, social marketing and crowdsourcing and co-creation model, all of which imply some engagement with external parties that transact and undertake that particular activity. But in reality, what is happening is we be, that, that linear model is becoming increasingly challenged and we are finding that the types of interactions that we become engaged with now are much much more matrix like and the, the sophisticated and nuanced exchanges between partners and actors within this value creation process is becoming much much more um, uh, integrated rather than a very very linear model, which was traditionally the case Really, the crowd economy is something of a um, extension on what is happening in those those areas. Now, it's not just me that's talking about the crowd economy, you know, and there are lots of people that, that speak about this, and it's worth thinking about some of the theoretical, academic, and philosophical underpinnings that um, create and uh, facilitate the, the crowd economy. Come from lots of different disciplines, and we can just go through a few of those to just give a sense of the underpinnings of what makes the crowd economy distinctive. Now, this gentleman here is a chap called Don Tapscott, and Don Tapscott wrote this particular book, Wikinomics. And the thrust behind Wikinomics is this maxim that not all the smart people work for you. Now, there's nothing new in the idea that not all the smart people work for you. Whilst we may try and recruit and retain excellent people, clearly uh, not all of the smart people will ever be inside your organization. And the point that Don makes in the book, which I heartily recommend, I haven't actually had an opportunity to read it, is that this is no longer a barrier or a problem because you can still engage with smart people external to your organization. And the 
the book itself is full of um, both the theoretical underpinnings of that and how it's facilitated through um, through digital technologies and how it's exemplified through things like wikis, which are collaborative um, um, projects. And again, uh, the great example being Wikipedia. But he demonstrates that this is no longer a barrier. It is in actual fact unity and that we should be actively seeking to find and source expertise and smartness from people external to the organization and engage with them for value creation. So again, you can see this is a, is a fundamental idea that um, underpins the crowd economy, this idea that we can find smart people external to our organization. You can also look at um, work like Chris Anderson's book, The Long Tail. Again, if, you, if you've not had a look at it, not read it, then I, I recommend that you do. And the point, the, the, the great point behind uh, this particular book is that it makes the, the verifiable claim that lots of small actions create or can create a big impact. So the long tail distribution model uh, demonstrates that the long extended tail of transactions actually cumulatively sums as much as the small, um, uh, large transactions. So if we think about an example for that, in the investment context, traditional investment model typically had small numbers of large investors backing, let's say, entrepreneurial activity. In a crowdfunding context, you can have many, many small transactions, small contributions, which cumulatively give us the same sum. Now, this is made possible by virtue of the fact that many of these transactions are undertaken digitally on platforms that we are not required to maintain. These are public goods. And consequently, the incremental cost of each transaction is driven down to such a point that it becomes economically viable to undertake many hundreds of small transactions uh, and still make it a viable and sustainable employ. Mm -hmm. Again, we're looking at digital technologies facilitating a radical adjustment to thinking about what is possible. The long tail is exemplified, uh, I guess, in a commercial context of how uh, uh, vendors like Amazon have been able to dominate a traditional marketplace, i.e. book selling, through a long tail model by being able, because they are digital, they are able to stock an, in, an incredibly large inventory and sell just one or two copies of each. That cumulatively is worth as much, if not more, than a small bookshop, which has to contain a smaller inventory and shift larger numbers um, of that, that limit. Um, so this is a, a key understanding that, that underpins the economy, the long tail model. We also need to think about motivations for action. Why is it that people undertake value creating activity? Now, uh, for a long, long time, Ronald Coase's model of explaining this was the generally widely accepted model that explained why it is that people engaged in uh, economic value generation. And I have given you the key point here. They do it either as employees in firms following the directions of managers or as individuals in marketplaces following price signal. What we have discovered, and in fact, it's not a, an entirely new idea, but what we are seeing is this happening at scale. And that is that we are finding there are different motivations for people to engage in value creation activities. And Yoki Benkler, Professor Yoki Benkler, who uh, uh, lectures at Princeton, um, describes this mode as commons-based peer production. These are people actively engaged and willingly engaged in value creation activities that do not fall into either as employees, as firms, following direction managers, or individuals in markets, following price signals. Step outside of that. So within the crowd economy, we can find people will engage with us in the process of value creation, a wide range of alternative motivations. And I think as I, as I opened up saying that I think cultural and heritage organizations are well placed for this, we can all already identify that in that circumstance, there are many people that engage with valuable activities with us, 
on the basis of passion, enthusiasm, and have no um, other means of expectation of return. So this, this speaks that I made that I think those organizations in the cultural and heritage sector, sector have a better understanding in some cases of what the, the opportunities in the crowd economy are than um, perhaps some other more commercially driven. And then perhaps for a final piece of philosophical and practical underpinning, we can look at uh, the wisdom of crowds. Again, a terrific read, James Surowiecki's book, what the, is uh, important about this particular book and is widely misunderstood is that deriving intelligence and wisdom from crowds only happens under certain circumstances. It is necessary to put in place those circumstances, to make these things work effectively. Simply um, calling to a crowd to offer a solution um, outside of the appropriate structures will not give you the solution that you want or is unlikely to generate real value. And uh, we can all think of examples of uh, crowdsourcing catastrophes, Boaty McBoatface obviously um, commonly um, comes to mind where a poorly constructed idea of calling on the crowd to name uh, a boat uh, ended up with uh, rather a third boating boat face um, solution. So unless we operate in the crowd economy with some understanding of the structures and principles that are necessary to make these things work effectively, then we are likely. So a useful lesson learned, I guess, if we uh, read that book and take on board that particular so if we think about the crowd economy, what does it really look like? What are the two key dimensions? And in essence, we can think about the crowd economy as having two dimensions with extremes on each. And one of them is where the focus of the value that we are looking for um, is to be found. Is it at one end within an individual who is external to the organization, it's out there in the crowd, but is essentially an, an individual or a very small group group or is it at the other end where we're looking to utilize the the entire crowd to derive some kind of value or is it somewhere in between and then on the other dimension we can think about given that this is reaching external to the organization what is the nature of the relationship that we are going to have with that asset external to the organization Going to be a very traditional one, a contractual, direct, formal, managed approach, or is it at the other extreme, one where we transact with them on the basis purely of trust, nothing else? We have no power within this circumstance. Is it a trust, or is it somewhere in between? And within that, we can plot a whole range of crowd economy type value creation models. And in the true management consultant style, I, I can't help myself from doing, I show you them here in four notional quadrants of A, B, C, and D. So you can see that in uh, C, where we are drawing largely on the crowd and that we are looking, uh, or we are engaging with them on the basis of, of uh, largely trust. Crowdfunding is a, um, uh, sits within that quadrant, um, whereas, Turking and crowdsourcing is much more down towards the, the uh, left-hand bottom uh, corner in the B quadrant. And each of these quadrants um, has a different type of dynamic within it. So it operates in a slightly different way. And it's important to understand that because um, unless you do, um, you may struggle to generate the types of engagement and relationships that you are looking for. Let me just illustrate that with a little um, graphic here. So the types of networks and structures and, and connections between groups that perform these functions uh, will be slightly different within each of those quadrants. So we refer to them as the net, the targets, the swell, the chain. Now, I don't intend to go into this in, in enormous detail today because uh, we would be getting uh, into uh, much more um, 
sophisticated um, discussions around these things and is necessary for the purposes of, of conveying the principle by which to convey to you. And that is that you need to think about the type of crowd economy engagement that you're doing and act appropriately. Put in place the appropriate structures, do the communications in the right way so that you get the type. So if you want to think about these um, examples that I referred to, what sort of examples can I refer to? Well, you will not be surprised that one of the most widely used crowd economy models that we can refer to is that of Wikipedia. Now, it's not an original one, um, it's, uh, but it is an extremely widely understood and well-known one. I mean, the Wikipedia organization, um, which is uh, probably the, the world's largest collection of information and data um, in a kind of encyclopedia format that's ever been brought together, uh, emerged extremely rapidly, um, effectively put all of the encyclopedia salesmen out of business, and it is in many cases the first point of call for anybody that wants an answer to a, a particular question, at least one answer to a particular but is maintained by a very small um, permanent members of staff. There are only about 11 people who work on Wikipedia. Most of it is managed through the community and most of the people that own the pages and own it in the sense that they manage and update them on a regular basis or contribute to the contents in Wikipedia do so simply out of a passion for the topic. Um, that doesn't mean to say that this is a straightforward process or that it is without control controversy uh, and doesn't present problems and uh, we'll, we'll return to that um, as a as a um, of, uh, note uh, later on um, but it is a fantastic um, manifestation of how it is possible to bring together very large groups of people on a um, collective project um, and manage it effectively and create value from it for the wider community as a public. Another example that was is an obvious one uh, is that of Linux, which is an open source software product, which most of the main uh, key computers running our financial systems and many other core systems across the globe run on, and indeed so do many of our smartphones and, and devices. It is an open source product, uh, that doesn't mean to say there aren't commercial opportunities around that. In many cases, they, they are in the form of freemium models, which is part of the, the crowd economy model, where you are putting a service wrap and charging for the service wrap rather than the core product, which is community maintained. But it is a distinctive uh, departure in, in its origination from the traditional software um, creation model, the typical Microsoft model, if you will, which is shrink wrapped um, proprietary protected model of software which shrink wrap ended to you. Linux in terms of its scale and reach would have cost in this estimate from 2008. So heaven knows what the sum would be these days, but a, a single distribution of Fedora would have cost about $10.8 billion to develop back in 2008. Um, which of course would have been unsustainable apart from with the very, very large software house. This is a public good maintained by the community, the community and in large part done so by um, uh, people that are simply doing it out of the, the desire to be part of that development and maintain the process. But we also think of things like IMDB. IMDB um, which was acquired by Amazon for a very significant sum, uh, was and still is largely fan-based maintained. So it is a group of enthusiasts that provide the architecture for fans in the broader sense to be able to maintain a um, collective um, view of internet um, movie data sets, so IMDB being the Internet Movie Database. So there are lots of examples of these type of, of um, crowd economy models. Obviously, crowdfunding is probably the one that tends to get the um, most recognition because in terms of its obvious value creation, because it is largely tied up 
with the notion of money. It raises funds. And here we have a screenshot of just one of many crowdfunding platforms that offer facilities for individuals and organizations to use to then raise money from the crowd, from the engaged group of people interested in the project they're trying to fund. And in this case, Unbound is a very specific crowdfunding platform in that it is uh, uh, limited in terms of its, of its focus and that it, it's about publishing books. So it says for authors to raise funds to, to publish, that is essentially all it raises funds. But even when we think about um, crowdfunding and think that, yes, it's about money, um, it's important that we understand that, that as with almost all um, activities and engagements in the crowd economy, there are many, many more things to be won from uh, a rich crowd engagement. And in the context of crowdfunding, <coughs> if uh, we were advising a client uh, who was thinking about crowdfunding, a key first stage for them in that process would be to establish clarity around what it is that they wanted to win from a crowdfunding campaign. And we always share with them this particular uh, breakdown where we believe are the big areas of return from a crowdfunding campaign. Now, clearly finance is one of those, but there's lots of nuance within that. But other things that you can gain from um, this crowd engagement include things like insight, um, communications networks. The context of what those uh, actually mean vary from project to project. But as you can imagine, if you are raising funds, to bring a new product to market and you are raising those funds through a crowdfunding campaign, you can simultaneously gain tremendous insight about market sizing, product features, um, acceptable price, you know, as, as valuable insight pieces so that your business plan, such as it is, is no longer a work of best guess fiction, but is based on absolute engagement with um, verifiable source of insight. Similarly, it can also simultaneously undertake communication activity. And similarly in a network, it, and to use, to stick with the example of bringing a new product to market, it may be that you're looking for logistics or paths to market or manufacturers. So a good, well-structured crowdfunding campaign can address all of those points. You need to understand what they are, before you run the campaign in order that you can extract that value from it. So these, these crowd engagements are rich and nuanced. And if they are planned and executed effectively, there are uh, there is much to be won from. So I want to start looking at some specific examples now. And uh, the first one that I'm going to uh, point out to you is uh, a typical crowdfunding campaign. Here we have the Sidmouth Folk Festival, who recently ran a fundraising campaign to assist them on the basis that they were unable to actually run the festival um, this year. And uh, this was a particularly successful one, and I wouldn't want to mislead you and suggest that the sums that they raised of over £100,000 is in any way typical. This is a particularly successful one. But as an established folk festival, they actually had uh, a strong, what I will refer to as crowd asset that they could um, already deal with. So they had a community, they had um, visibility, and they had engagement with people um, through having run the, camp, the, the festival for uh, a number of years. They had that ability to tap into an asset, a crowd asset that they already had. But you can also see crowdfunding campaigns in a, in a heritage context, which might be, for example, acquisition of a, of a particular item for a, for a collection. So in this case, this is an example of um, a, a Charlotte Bronte book that they wish to secure for the Bronte Society in Haworth. And again, this is a particularly successful campaign. And yeah, I wouldn't want to set your expectations. This is very much at the upper end of what a typical reward crowdfunding campaign can reach this raise somewhere in the region of £86,000 to secure this item. So um, these are these are all um, useful examples, um, but um, represent some of the more successful uh, 
But looking at this from a, a specifically heritage point of view, I'd like to just point out um, uh, an interesting example from my standpoint, um, where uh, a heritage organization has done a really rather excellent job of uh, utilizing its crowd assets to weather the, um, the period of uh, the, the COVID disruption when the tank museum has been closed for an extended period to actually offset some of the financial impact that that has caused. Now, the Tank Museum, if you've not come across, is in Bovington. It's a well-established um, museum, has been around for a considerable amount of time. They are all they are utilizing uh, an emerging and more common model of um, engagement with the crowd called patronage or membership models. So in this model, they undertake to produce content on a regular basis in return for a continuing financial contribution from their crowd. Now, you'll be pleased to know that we uh, at Expo North are actually going to be uh, having a podcast interview with the head of marketing at uh, Bobbington over the next couple of months. So you can look out for that on the, the Expo North website to hear it specifically from them. But patronage models um, are increasingly common in the creative cultural and heritage sectors because these are organizations and individuals who have a capacity to um, engage with the community and uh, to, if they can, adjust their content production model effectively, do this um, and create funding from it. So in this particular case, just to, this, is, this is actually the Tank Museum's um, page on Patreon. And they have a series of membership levels where people uh, sign up to uh, submit funds on a monthly basis. And each of those membership models uh, attracts a, a different fee and will receive obviously different uh, types of returns from that. And you can see from the bottom of the screen that this is returning uh, at the moment somewhere in the region of six and a half thousand pounds a month to, um, to the bottom um, tank museum. And so it'll be interesting to see, uh, to hear from them how they've gone about that. Other examples of value creation from engagement with the crowd, uh, by the people. This is a project that um, emerges from the, the Library of Congress in the United States. This is a crowdsourcing model where they uh, utilize uh, the um, voluntary curators to assist them in pulling together and maintaining and extending upon their collection. And in this case, it was uh, initiated through a project for scanning of the, the handwritten le uh, letters of President Lincoln, and they used the volunteers to effectively, uh, progressively correct the OCR mistakes uh, and create then a fully digitally accessible um, and fully um, OCR version of those letters. And by the people is an ongoing project which now consistently brings in new new projects through the course um, of its activities. You can find others of that. Here we have the Euro Europeana um, project. Uh, in this case, they are looking at folksonomies or creating taxonomies. In other words, they, they, they're using, <clears throat> using the crowd to tag publicly available um, European works of art so that they group them into more intelligence led uh, and more accessible groupings as understood by the people that uh, uh, consume them. So a crowdsourcing project. Uh, Europeana also do um, another, which is in a way similar to the By the People project from the Library of Congress, which is a uh, the uh, transcribe um, project. Again, this is where uh, a group of voluntary curators will uh, transcribe uh, documents so that they can be put into the public domain in multiple languages. And uh, they run uh, a collaborative events called transcribathons, where they bring people together to, to make rapid progress, but they're also uh, ongoing um, projects so that, that they are open-ended into which the project uh, are completed. And you can get a sense here of the, some of the numbers involved, 54,000 documents um, being, have been uh, processed. Um, so it's, a, a, it's an interesting and ongoing project of a heritage organization utilizing 
the, uh, the power of the crowd to create value for their, their collection. So let's think about um, these, this, this idea of engaging with the crowd. Clearly what is necessary to affect uh, uh, creating value from the crowd economy is to build an engagement with a group of people uh, over a period of time, which you can then translate into value creating activities for you. And this takes time and it takes effort. And in essence, what the, 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 you can take this from absolute first basis. So looking back at the tank museum, here's a classic example thing that pretty much everybody should be doing if they can, if they're a heritage organization. And that is capturing email addresses and managing that as a first step to engaging with the crowd. So here we have just a screenshot from the, the Bobbington Bank Museum. They, they have a uh, email list. Now clearly the purpose of this is to progressively develop um, what we call social and relationship capital within the crowd. So the social capital uh, is essentially an expression of the absolute numbers of people that you can reach with a single communication. And the relationship capital is an expression across that group of the depth of relationship that you have. And in any crowd engagement project or strategy, you are looking to increase both of those. So you are looking to increase the absolute numbers, the social capital, and as far as possible across that piece, build the relationship capital. Because the deeper the relationship, the higher the opportunity that you can translate that relationship into value creation. What does that mean? What are the implications for an organization that starts to undertake this type of strategy? Well, you need a plan. This is a strategic effort. It is something that needs to be done in a coordinated and trackable way. Because one of the implications is that there is an expectation that you will be uh, content on a regular basis. Now, you shouldn't be daunted by that. It's uh, actually surprising how much content we produce that is of value to our community, whether we don't even think about. Now, here I've got lifted a, a quote from Eric Turneson. Eric Turneson is the chief executive of Member Mouse, uh, which is a facility that allows the management and transacting of that type of patronage membership relationship. And again, we did a terrific uh, interview with Eric uh, at Expo North, and you can pick that up as one of the podcasts on. Uh, the Expo North website. And as he says, things that you are so used to doing that are habitual to you are actually content. There are tons of people that will be interested in it. So uh, things that you do day to day that you perhaps find mundane are often of interest to uh, people that are not part of your um, day to day activities. And as much as curation activities, practice, um, composition, all of these things are interesting rather than just display or um, performance. So it's, it's, it's possible to be creative in the way one thinks about content creation, but you do need to have a plan. But the content can take lots of different forms and lots of the activities that you perhaps think of as being a little sophisticated are readily available to you now. Um, so let me just run through a few examples. Uh, rich content like podcasts, um, lots and lots of terrific podcasts um, uh, out there, easy to produce, low cost to produce. I am involved with the Highland Objects podcast series, which again, we, we crowdsource the, the material from heritage organizations across Scotland and produce the podcast. And we recently undertook a, a, a vote. We had some nearly 7,000 votes cast on our recent um, vote for which would be the most um, favorable or next podcast to be made from the list of objects available. What's interesting about that is how the organizations participating in that are in uh, developing their ability to reach out to their communities through the activity of being involved with Highland uh, objects, also that they can analyze their engagement and um, through the activities that they're undertaking as part of the Highland Objects project. We can also see things like uh, streaming, streaming increasingly common. I know that next week there is a, is a, a session um, on uh, digital streaming and content, rich content creation. So here we have um, uh, the um, 
Nick Cave doing his recent performance from Alexander Palace. Not everybody's going to do it to the high production values that he did for that performance, but streaming and uh, making available live content as of we are today on this is readily available to you. It doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive or complex process. You can make use of apps more effectively. Uh, so event-driven apps or event management apps, like for example, the Socio app, which Expo North uses to enhance its ability to deliver virtual events, tremendously valuable in terms of a mechanism of reaching out to a community, binding them in, engaging them in activities, gamification, a whole range of activities that you can do through that. And these products are readily available to you. You don't have to develop the app yourself. Similarly, if you're interested in gamification, Microsoft's Minecraft, terrific tool that you can create gamified engagement opportunities for the crowd, particularly useful in an education context, but can work in lots and lots of different ways, um, but, but powerful ways of engaging with a younger demographic, if that was something that you're, that you're seeking to do. Similarly, if we want to create virtual event spaces, we can do that with, you know, Mozilla Hubs, so it's perfectly possible to create a virtual gallery, a virtual display. Again, all of these things readily available to you and not uh, technically challenging uh, to, uh, to develop. We can see greater acceptance of and, and use of virtual reality. So here we have um, uh, work done to develop the virtual tour of Ayers Rock or Uluru as it's, it's, it's commonly referred to now because uh, we're now unable to um, access that, that site on foot anymore. Um, we, we can create virtual um, uh, environments to actually consume that sort of product. Um, oddly enough, but if you want to uh, apps, often people think about apps as something that has to be coded from scratch, is a sophisticated thing you need to bring in a third party to produce for you. Not the case, there are some terrific app building tools out there Appy Pie being one of the most common ones, but for managing volunteers, engaging people and uh, creating workflow situations and value from engaging with the crowd, apps are out there and readily buildable and hosted by these types of organizations for you. You don't have to uh, enter into costly development cycles to create apps. And in terms of three-dimensional um, rendering and virtual reality, Virtual reality and augmented reality, again, uh, Sketchfab, a platform that will host these things for you and provide you with tools to actually share them into your offering in a digital context. And creating 3D renderings, very straightforward with products like SketchUp. These things are not technically challenging anymore. They are readily available for you to actually um, deliver yourself with limited or no technical expertise, but you can build rich experiences using these easy access types. And these are just a few examples of how you can build engagement around. So moving on to just some basic advice for you if you're thinking about um, crowd engagement and utilizing the crowd economy. I'm not gonna pretend it is anything other than hard work. These things do take time, they are not simple solutions but they are very much of the future and it is something that you uh, will see benefit from if you invest the time and effort delivering it but there are specific rules and ideas and concepts that underpin these things and it is worth getting familiar with them so i'm just going to make passing reference to a few things here like Dunbar's numbers, which are you know, built on very, very well-established anthropological data about high, high touch relationships and how many we can reasonably include with them. And also understanding the dynamics of networks and how uh, networks um, relate to one another, how you breach into other networks, how you create viral reach. These have all got very practical and uh, easily accessible and actually not difficult to understand principles like, for example, Granovetter's work on the strength of weak ties. And if you're going to get into this space and create the strategy to do it, it's worth understanding what these things are. 
and there are, it's a highly complex environment. So again, understanding and adopting the appropriate behaviors that are right for complex environments, highly iterative ones, as explained through things like the Kinefin framework, it's worth getting to understand these principles. But at a very, very practical level, never forget in crowd engagement, it is a listening exercise. You absolutely must listen. You're not broadcasting, you're engaging in a conversational relationship with your crowd. It can be a frightening thing. It's not necessarily for the faint hearted. Not everything that you hear from the crowd will necessarily make you happy. So enter this, this area with eyes open and understand the challenges that it will present to you, but be ready for it. Analysis, really, really important that you undertake analysis and monitor what you're doing and understand what is working and what is not and adjust yourself. Be that through social media analysis, looking at streaming data statistics, whatever it is that you're planning to do, take an analytical approach so that you can understand whether you're doing things better or not. And it takes time. These things do take time. They um, do not happen instantly or overnight. So you will need to invest time in it. But the message is the crowd is an asset for you. So you should absolutely nurture it. And just to recap on what we said we were going to cover through, through this session, why we're doing it now. So this idea that COVID has given us uh, a chance to reassess and given us a set of circumstances to build upon. We looked at what the crowd economy is, this concept of value being external, created external to the organization. We understand the opportunities that exist. We looked at a few examples. We quickly went through some of the tools to build rich engagements with the crowd. And I offered some advice and now I'm open to any Q&A that you want to ask off the back of what we discussed in the last while. Uh, I know we have perhaps a little less time for Q&A, but I, I will happily hang around for as long as necessary to answer the questions that you've got in for me, if you have any. And thank you for your attention. Fantastic, Tim. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I have popped my camera back on. And I'm here to monitor the, the chat boxes in the Q&A section to, uh, to feel anything that uh, our attendees have, uh, have got for you. Uh, so I'm going to sit here and see if, uh, if anybody... Maybe I've covered absolutely everything. To, uh, to maybe send maybe I've away. frightened them all to death about what... Uh, or maybe it's the butterflies behind me that uh, will... They think that actually I'm a lepidopterist in my spare time, which is not true. But <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Doesn't reflect well on me. Boom, boom. Is it? Oh, oh Any dear! Questions from what a terrible way to to bring things. Well, there we go. I must have answered every single question. Keeping, keeping, keeping a little eye on my chat. I think you've, you've done such a uh, such an impeccable <laughs> job, Tim. You've, uh, you've you've obviously covered uh, every Everything every that anybody could ever want. That's fine. That's perfectly acceptable. We don't Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. Um, if anybody has any questions that occur to them after this uh, and would like to get in touch with me, do do so through Expo North. Um, or if anybody thinks that it would be interesting to have a conversation with me around a particular project that they might be launching in this space. Again, the Expo North website is the place to go to access the uh, digital support services that operate throughout the year. And I made mention of a number of resources that are available on the uh, Expo North website covering things like uh, podcasts with um, uh, Member Mouse. We also have facilities and material on there talking about podcasting itself. Uh, and of course, next week, there will be a session uh, speaking specifically about um, streaming uh, media content to the, to the crowd which of course form part of what we discussed. So Expo North's uh, website is a terrific source of resources 
for this type of um, uh, type of challenge if it's something that you wish to undertake. My head is spinning. Well, I, I'm, team. I'm not seeing anything. I, I'm seeing I'm a chat from here, and I'm not also not seeing anything. Uh, Rana, I'm glad. I'm oh, glad. There we go. I'm very pleased that uh, it was informative. I'm sorry if I made your head spin. I did rather try and uh, put quite a lot in there, but certainly from that, I think you you will find all of the main foundational pieces uh, for you to. Um, uh, dip into the world of the, the crowd economy if you so wish. So thank you very much for your comment, really appreciate it. Well, I guess with that then, perhaps we uh, should draw a veil over this. Uh, I think we've pretty much filled our allotted time. And uh, I thank everybody for their uh, their attendance and their attention. And um, I I just reiterate that point that if you wish to get in touch with me um, or find more information about some of the things that we talked about, do visit the Expo North website. So thank you very much. That's great, Tim. Thanks ever so much. And uh, for the attendees that are still here, don't forget to uh, to tune in same place, same time uh next week for our um thanks ever so much tim see you again very soon ciao thanks a lot cheers